ex worker. An audio strike against a monotone world. A podcast of anarchist ideas and action. For everyone who dreams of a life off the clock. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Ex Worker. This is our second episode in our coverage of the crisis in Rojava. In our previous episode, we discussed at length how the Turkish invasion came about and the consequences it's likely to have, discussed the various forces fighting in Syria and the interactions between them, and the tough choices the Kurdish forces have had to make to survive trapped between various hostile authoritarian powers and outlined our argument for critical solidarity and more. But despite all of that context and analysis, we didn't go very much into the history behind the struggle. The autonomous provinces of Rojava are rooted in what they call democratic confederalism, a mode of self-organization rooted in local and regional councils, feminism and women's participation, ecology and pluralism that respects many ethnic and religious groups. But where did this all come from? What prompted these experiments to emerge, and why is Turkey so determined to crush them? To get some insight into these questions, we're going to look back at the history of the Kurdish struggle. Back in 2015, as Rojava was beginning to attract attention and support from anarchists around the world, CrimeThink published an article called Understanding the Kurdish Resistance, a historical overview and eyewitness report. It describes the emergence of the Kurdish Workers' Party, the PKK, and its conflicts with Turkish nationalism, waves of insurgency and repression, the evolution of Kurdish radical thought, the revolutionary patriotic youth movement, the Gezi Park uprising in Istanbul, the siege of Kobani, and lots more. We offer this in hopes of giving you a more detailed background for understanding what's going on there today. Understanding the Kurdish Resistance A Historical Overview and Eyewitness Report Until recently, few in the Western world had heard of the Kurds, let alone their revolutionary history. Brought into the spotlight by their fight against the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, ISIS, they've received a great deal of attention, both from the mainstream mass media and from radicals and revolutionaries around the world. Kurdistan refers to the traditional homelands of the Kurdish people, but has never corresponded to a modern nation-state. Geographically, Kurdistan is defined by cardinal directions. Western Kurdistan, which is in northern Syria, is called Rojava, or West. Northern Kurdistan, which is in southeastern Turkey, is Bakur, North. Southern Kurdistan, in northern Iraq, is Bashur, South. And Eastern Kurdistan, in southwestern Iran, is Rojalat, East. Romanticized and often summarized superficially as a population fighting Islamists, the Kurds have a tradition of self-defense extending across several national borders. They've been fighting for their liberation since the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire, if not before. The religious revolts led by Sheikh Said in 1925 and the uprising against assimilation in Dersim in 1937 are only two examples out of a long legacy of Kurdish resistance. But without a doubt, the most long-lasting and effective Kurdish rebellion has been the one launched by the PKK, or Kurdish Workers' Party, 40 years ago. The resistance to ISIS in northern Syria, western Kurdistan, Rojava, and the fight for the autonomy of the Kurds in Turkey, northern Kurdistan, Bakur, are the culmination of the PKK's decades-long struggle. Yet the PKK looks very different today than it did during its formation and its aspirations have evolved alongside its political context. What follows is my attempt to share what I have learned and observed during my visits to Kurdistan, both in Bakur and Rojava. 
It's a long and complex story filled with difficult contradictions, some of which will be presented below. In the face of incredible odds, the resilient Kurds have been able to put theory into practice alongside a well-crafted strategy. To understand their movement today, let's start by looking at how it emerged. The early days of the PKK. The PKK is the product of two different historical processes. The first and more fundamental one is the formation of the Turkish nation state, a project based on the elimination of all non-Muslims and the assimilation of all non-Turkish ethnicities. The second and more immediate accelerant is the powerful youth and student movement of the late 1960s and 70s in Turkey. To understand contemporary Turkish politics, be it the official denial of the Armenian genocide or the repression of the Kurdish movement, we must recognize how deeply ultranationalism is woven into the fabric of society. It's analogous to the Ba'athist regimes elsewhere in the region, which are now meeting their expiration dates. All the ingredients are there. A formidable and charismatic leader, Mustafa Kemal, or Ataturk. The creation of a national identity, Turkishness and assimilation into a hegemonic yet constructed culture. In Turkey, the formal creation of the nation-state in 1923 was a modernizing project in its own right. Various vernacular languages, Kurdish, Arabic, Armenian, Greek, as well as the Arabic alphabet, modified and used in writing Ottoman, Kurdish, and Persian in addition to Arabic, were scrapped in favor of the Latin alphabet. A language called Turkish was reinvented, by modernizing vernacular Turkish with a heavy dose of European influence. Forms of religious expression, from public gatherings to clothing, were repressed in the name of modern secularism. At the same time, Islam became regulated by the state, kept in reserve to mobilize against leftists or minorities. As a nation-building project, Kemalism essentially sowed the seeds of its own destruction. Ironically, it's responsible for both the neoliberal Islam of Erdogan and the AKP and the democratic confederalism of Ujlan in the PKK. The degree to which this ultranationalism is hammered into those who live within the borders of Turkey is difficult for a Western audience to grasp. Every morning of her official schooling, a Kurdish schoolchild has to take an oath that begins, I am Turkish, I am right, I work hard, only to file into a classroom with a portrait of Ataturk staring down from the wall, where she will hear teachers present the history of the Ottoman Empire and emphasize that Turkey is surrounded by enemies on all sides. She must go through the motions of patriotic holidays several times a year. The anniversary of the Declaration of the Republic? Okay. The anniversary of the death of Ataturk? Well, fine. The Youth and Sports Holiday? Seriously? The Sovereignty and Children's Holiday? <laughs> Give me a break. For men, compulsory military service is a rite of passage into manhood and a precondition for employment. Incidentally, although Turkey has a universal conscription, it also has laws which permit one to pay nearly $10,000 to be exempted from it. In addition, those with higher level education are often able to land safer positions. Thus, those who actually fight the wars are predominantly poor. It's common to see rowdy street rituals in which young men are sent off to do their military service by crowds of their closest male friends. Nationalism comes not only from the right, but also from the left and the 1968 generation was no exception. In contrast to their counterparts in other countries, this generation resembled the old left more than the new. Many of the most revered veterans and martyrs of the leftist student movement saw themselves as continuing Ataturk's project of national liberation from imperialist powers. It's telling that the most promising move on the part of the leftist student movement involved launching a failed coup of their own with dissident members of the military. This powerful youth movement occupied many universities and organized large marches, including an infamous march in which members of the U.S. Navy's 6th Fleet were dumped into the sea, playing on the mythical imagery of Ataturk's National Liberation Army dumping the Greeks into the Aegean Sea, a fairy tale often repeated to Turkish schoolchildren. Though it was eventually crushed by the military coup of March 12, 1971, the student movement left a legacy of armed groups, including the Turkish People's Liberation Army, the THKO, and the Turkish People's Liberation Party, THKP. One of the students active in the post-coup second wave of the student movement in Turkey was Abdullah Ujalan. 
Born in 1949 in the Kurdish territories of southeastern Turkey, Öcalan came to the Turkish capital of Ankara in 1971 to study. He was impressed by the student movement, which had gone as far as torching the vehicle of the American ambassador. Alongside the Turkish student movement, which left little space to talk about the Kurds, there was a new incarnation of Kurdish socialism on the rise, especially in the form of the Eastern Revolutionary Cultural Houses. Other Kurdish groups had even started to organize guerrillas in Kurdistan. Öcalan entered this milieu and advanced his idea of Kurdistan as an internal colony of Turkey, quickly gaining adherence. Not all the members of this initial cadre were Kurds, but they all believed in Kurdish liberation from the Turkish state. This core group left Ankara to foment revolution in Kurdistan. The ideological flavor of the day, especially with Turkey as a member of NATO, was Marxism-Leninism. The PKK, founded in 1978 at a meeting in the village of Fis, modeled itself on those principles. The first manifesto written by Öcalan that year closes by professing that the Kurdish revolution was a part of the global proletarian revolution that started with the Russian October Revolution and was growing stronger through national liberation movements. The group acquired its first AK-47 from Syria and started carrying out small actions and agitating in towns in northern Kurdistan. Öcalan traveled constantly, presenting lengthy lectures, sometimes day-long sessions, which were a major component of these initial efforts. This form is still seen in the political education sessions that all participants in the Kurdish movement are expected to complete, guerrillas and politicians alike. This initial phase was cut short by another military coup only 10 years later, in 1980, much bloodier in its consequences, with at least 650,000 people arrested, more than 10,000 tortured, and 50 people hanged by the state. Öcalan had fled the country shortly before, and many of the initial cadre followed in his footsteps. Their destination? Syria. In fact, Öcalan crossed from Suric in Turkey into Kobani in Syria, two towns that have become symbols of the Kurdish resistance, and a crossing hundreds if not thousands of Kurds have made this past year to join the fight against ISIS. From Syria, Öcalan started his project in earnest and began to make contact with the Kurdish leadership in the region, arranging meetings with Barzani and Talibani, tribal leaders with a bourgeois nationalist line. He arranged for the first trainings of Kurdish guerrillas in Palestinian camps, and later in more independently run camps in Lebanon. The trained members of the PKK crossed back into Turkey to begin the armed struggle announced by their first large-scale action in August of 1984, the raids on the towns of Erech and Shemdinli. The PKK entered the 1990s with a guerrilla army of more than 10,000, and started launching attacks on Turkish military positions and other state interests, such as government buildings and large-scale engineering projects. At the same time, what had begun as a concentrated effort by a core group of militants began to take hold within the entire Kurdish population in the region. Nehruz 1992 was a turning point in popularizing the Kurdish liberation struggle. Nehruz, celebrated until recently mostly across Iran and northern Iraq, represents the new year and the welcoming of spring. Although this celebration was even observed in Central Asian Turkic communities, Turkey rejected it. The PKK advanced the idea of Nuros as a national holiday of resistance for northern Kurdistan. Since the late 1980s, March 21st has been a day of mass gatherings, often culminating in epic clashes with the police. Nuros of 1992 was especially brutal, as the ruthless police state that was to devastate northern Kurdistan began to show its face. The killing of 50 people during Nuros 1992 in the town of Chizre was the opening act. The 90s in Kurdistan saw the dirtiest of civil wars, with the state employing paramilitary groups culled from both ultra-nationalists and Islamic fundamentalists. To dry out the sea in which the guerrillas swam, 4,500 villages were evacuated or burned to the ground. Most of the 40,000 people who have died in the war in northern Kurdistan perished in the 1990s. Ojalan's Prison Years and the Peace Process Ojalan's eventual capture on February 15, 1999 is a tale to be told, referred to by the Kurdish movement as the Great Conspiracy. Threatened by Turkish military action, the Syrian government finally told Ujalan that his welcome was over and he had to leave. 
The international cadre of the PKK scrambled to find him a new refuge, but no country would touch him. Shuttled between Greece and Russia, Ujalan finally found himself under house arrest in Italy. Since members of the European Union are not allowed to extradite prisoners to countries where capital punishment exists, one early morning Ujalan was shuttled to Kenya, where he was picked up by Turkish commandos. Drugged and tied up, Ujalan was flown back to Turkey. The video of this had a chilling effect across Kurdistan. A new phase of the Kurdish struggle was at the door. The PKK had to reinvent itself with its leader behind bars and sentenced to death, the only prisoner in an island prison about 50 miles from Istanbul. In the end, Turkey abolished capital punishment in its quest to join the European Union, and Ujalan's sentence was commuted to life in prison. This also meant that the Turkish state could utilize him in the future. Between 1999 and 2004, the PKK declared a ceasefire, although the Turkish state massacred close to 800 fighters as they were attempting to leave the country to reach their main base in Iraq. This was the closest the PKK ever came to decomposition, and Ujalan's supreme authority was challenged. But, as he himself has pointed out, the history of the PKK is a history of purges. The PKK cadre centered around Ujalan survived its challengers, including his own brother. In prison, Ujalan found time to read and write as he immersed himself in a panoply of thinkers and subjects. Many have referenced how he studied Murray Bookchin. Incidentally, although Western leftists are fascinated by the Bookchin-Ujalan connection, it's not as if Kurdish militants are walking around with Bookchin under their arms in the region. Sure, democratic confederalism resembles libertarian municipalities, but pointing to Bookchin as the ideological forefather reeks of Eurocentrism. Ujalan also studied Immanuel Wallerstein in his World Systems Analysis, as well as texts on the history of civilization in Mesopotamia. Under the guise of formulating his defense for the Turkish courts, as well as to the European Human Rights Court in providing a roadmap for peace in Turkey, he penned several manifestos in which he broke with his traditional views on national liberation, with all of its historical Marxist-Leninist baggage, and formulated more palatable ideas under his conditions of imprisonment. These ideas were democratic autonomy and confederalism. A further development shifted the context of the Kurdish question. In late 2002, the Justice and Development Party, or AKP, headed to this day by the despotic President Erdogan, won the general elections and came to power, ending more than a decade of dysfunctional coalition governments. Modeling itself as what can be termed Islamic neoliberalism, the AKP set about integrating Turkey further into the global financial system by means of privatization, enclosure, and incurring debt. In effect, the debt once owed to the IMF is now held by the private sector. At the same time, Turkey was subjected to de-secularization by a creeping fundamentalist morality and the authoritarian rule of Erdogan. Erdogan presented this project as returning Turkey to its rightful historical place by reincarnating its Ottoman heritage and emphasizing economic growth for the nation. In May 2004, the PKK once again began a phase of armed struggle, ending the ceasefire that it held since 1999. Kurds endured increasing repression by the Turkish state in cross-border operations into PKK positions in northern Iraq. As he consolidated power, Erdogan came to realize that peace with the Kurds would facilitate his plans for regional domination that included petroleum reserves in northern Iraq and a number of oil pipelines running through the region. By allying himself with the large Kurdish population, he hoped to pass a number of constitutional changes cementing his power. To put these plans into place, in 2009, the Turkish intelligence agency started to act as an intermediary in negotiations between the AKP and PKK representatives in a meeting in Oslo. Despite the renewed dialogue and various other overtures, the Turkish state continued its repression against Kurds. Militarily, one of the most horrific acts was the bombing of 34 Kurdish peasants on December 28, 2011, in Roboski, Shirnak. The Turkish state claimed they were members of the PKK crossing the border, but then had to admit that they were common villagers involved in cross-border commerce. To this day, no one has been brought in front of a judge for those murders, and the victims of Roboski remain fresh in many people's minds. The ceasefires came and went with increasing frequency through those years. By the summer of 2012, the PKK had gained considerable territorial power. In this situation, compelled by his territorial ambitions, Erdogan announced that meetings had been taking place with Ujalan. 
Three months later, during 2013's New Rose, a letter from Ujalan was read in which he announced another ceasefire. This ceasefire was relatively long-lasting, remaining in place until July 24, 2015. But just when it seemed like stability was returning to Turkey, a chasm opened up in the Turkish reality on May 31, 2013. This was the Gezi resistance. Gezi. The Gezi resistance was the largest and fiercest social movement the Turkish Republic has seen enacted by its non-Kurdish population. A movement sparked by a struggle against the development of a park in central Istanbul grew into an all-out national revolt against Erdogan and his neoliberal policies. Kurds were present in the Gezi resistance, too, especially after it matured into a non-nationalist and pro-revolutionary event. But for the first time in Turkish history, the Kurds were not the main protagonists of an insurrection. The participation of the Kurdish movement in the Gezi resistance is still a controversial topic. A subtle bitterness can be felt on both ends. Many in western Turkey felt like the Kurds were at best too late to join the uprising, and at worst did not even want to, for fear of jeopardizing their negotiations and peace process. In response, Kurds in the region pointed to the lack of meaningful solidarity from ethnic Turks during massacre after massacre committed against them over the preceding decades. In reality, both of these positions are caricatures. Many Kurds participated in the clashes around Gezi from day one. Shortly after the park was taken from the police, the Kurdish political party of that time, the BDP, set up a large encampment at its entrance and flew flags with Ujalan's face over Taksim Square, a surreal sight. Additionally, Kurds were already engaged in their own civil disobedience campaign against the construction of fortress-like military bases in their region. In the run-up to the Gezi Rebellion, the above-ground wing of the Kurdish movement was in the process of forming the HDP, or People's Democracy Party, after more than a year of consultations as the HDK, or People's Democratic Congresses. One of their MPs stood in front of a bulldozer along with only a dozen or so people to block the uprooting of trees during the first protests in Gezi, well before it became a massive uprising. It's no coincidence, then, that when it was time to select a logo for the HDP, they chose an image of a tree. Regardless of grudges, Gezi forever transformed Turkey, and with it the Kurdish liberation movement's relationship to Turkish society in general, and towards the AKP and the peace process in particular. Many Turks who were on the receiving end of police brutality had the veil lifted from their eyes and were finally able to imagine the suffering taking place in southeastern Turkey. The media blackout of the Gezi resistance made it clear to the participants that they must have been kept in the dark about what was actually transpiring in Kurdistan. At the tail end of the Gezi resistance, when a Kurdish youth named Medeni Yildirim was killed protesting the construction of a fortress-like police station in Kurdistan, the movement saw him as one of its own and organized solidarity demonstrations with the Kurds. This furious yet joyous rebellion, initiated by a generation that came of age under successive unstable coalition governments, only to become adults under Erdogan's decade-long iron rule, served to consolidate hatred against the president. Wild Youth of Kurdistan. Chizre is the epicenter of a region in northern Kurdistan called Botan. The towering mountains in this region are the location of many PKK camps, and the towns at their base are some of the most rebellious. Chizre in particular continues to play an important role to this day. Chizre is where the fourth strategic struggle period of the PKK materialized shifting the point of conflict from mountainous landscapes dotted with guerrilla camps to urban epicenters in which cells of Kurdish militants organized. In June 2013, in the town of Chizre, a group of 100 youth standing ceremonially in formation announced the beginning of the Revolutionary Patriotic Youth Movement, or YDGH. With members ranging from their early teens to well into their 20s, this new organization coordinated urban guerrilla activity within every major metropolitan center inside Turkish borders. Kurdish youth began to employ Molotov cocktails instead of stones. 
the recent spike of urban combat in Kurdish towns and neighborhoods can be attributed to this new organization. Rebellious Kurdish youth were especially effective October 6th through 8th, 2014, when it appeared that the city of Kobani in Rojava was about to fall to ISIS. With the sanction of the official Kurdish leadership, Kurdish youth went on the offensive, devastating state forces. The implicit demand in the riots was for Turkey to stop providing logistical and material support to ISIS and to allow Kurdish forces passage across its borders, for example, by allowing some heavier artillery to cross Turkey to reach Kobani from Iraq. After the deaths of 50 people and the imposition of curfews in six different cities and martial law in the Kurdish capital of Ahmed, the Turkish government finally permitted the Iraqi Kurdish Peshmerga of the KDP to reach Kobani with their weapons. There are great political differences between the PYD, the public political organization affiliated with the PKK, and the KDP, the current regime of Kurds in northern Iraq, who have had autonomy since the first Gulf War in 1991. The PKK, PYD are fighting for a social revolution based on self-governance, self-defense, autonomy, and women's liberation, with an emphasis on ecology and a critique of all hierarchies, most notably state power. The KDP, on the other hand, is cultivating a national Kurdish bourgeoisie and acts as a close ally of Erdogan. In the 1990s, the KDP fought together with Turkey against the PKK. Tensions remain high. The YDGH is perhaps strongest in Chizre. After the uprising in defense of Kobani, Chizre entered the national discourse again when youth rose up following the funeral of Umit Kurt, taking control of the three neighborhoods of Sur, Trudi, and Nur. They were able to create an autonomous zone within these neighborhoods for two months, by digging a total of 184 ditches around their neighborhoods. The Turkish state effectively lost control of this area as the youth took over, burning down at least five buildings belonging to the state or its associated interests, including a school where many of them were also students. On a tour of Chizre, I asked some of the members of the YDGH why they dug ditches rather than building barricades, the traditional revolutionary method of asserting autonomy since time immemorial. My host, Hapo, explained that since the youth are armed with AK-47s, rocket-propelled grenades, and small arms, the police cannot exit their armored vehicles, but they can still plow through barricades. But again, since they cannot exit their vehicles, they also cannot traverse the ditches. Hapo described how at first they used pickaxes and shovels to excavate these ditches, but then they commandeered construction vehicles. The construction vehicles of the municipal government, he said, <laughs> sneaking a subtle smile. I realized he meant the municipal government belonging to the above-ground political party of the Kurdish movement, the HDP. The wild youth of Chizre are organized into teams of around 10 individuals. Hapo told me that once the number of a team grows to more than 30, they split into smaller groups. The teams take their names from Kurdish martyrs, often recent ones, and sometimes from Chizre itself, an eerie reproduction of martyrdom and militancy. Teams claim their territory by tagging their names on walls, much as graffiti crews do elsewhere around the world. During the high point of the clashes, each neighborhood establishes a base where explosives, Molotov cocktails, and weapons are stockpiled during the day in preparation for the confrontations that occur at night. The younger children are sometimes on the front lines throwing rocks at armored police vehicles, but they are always the ones who sound the alarm by running through the neighborhood, shouting, The system is coming! The enemy is coming! The division is clear for the Kurdish militants, both in the personal and the political. There is the system, and there is the struggle. Students leave the system, universities, in order to join the struggle. The system and capitalist social relations inevitably corrupt all forms of romantic love. Hence, real love is love for your people, for whom you struggle. Young militants 20 years of age are not allowed to succumb to their carnal desires or fall in love. If they do, and they're honest about it, they will have to provide a self-criticism and hopefully get away with a punishment only involving a further, perhaps collective, self-criticism session on the platform, as they say in the PKK. It is clear that the PKK is at a turning point. A new generation of militants is hitting the streets, transforming the character of the movement. Perhaps the formation of the YDGH was a way for the old guard to assert more control over the rebellious youth of the Kurdish slums. Even if such a strategy was at play, the youth are proving hard to control. The official leadership is acknowledging that there are groups acting outside of their directives. 
Only Ujalan himself could rein them in. The future of the PKK and the Kurdish movement will be determined by these rebellious youth. Will they follow the party line lockstep, or come up with their own ideas? Ultimately, Ujalan had to intervene for the ditches to be closed on March 2, 2015. When I brought this up to Hapo, who consistently expressed skepticism about the official leadership of the HDP and the peace process, he said that Ujalan is the line they don't cross, and that their insurrection in Chisre has strengthened his negotiating hand within prison. I was left wondering how much of the leadership cult around Ujalan has to do with his imprisonment, and whether the democratic structures being put in place constitute an attempt to abolish himself as the leader. On September 4th, the Turkish military and police invaded Chisre and declared a curfew which would last for nine days. They enforced this curfew by placing snipers on the minarets of mosques to shoot anyone out on the streets. The siege was only broken under the pressure of a march organized by Kurds from the surrounding towns, which was joined by the HDP's parliament members. When people finally entered the town, they found 21 civilians dead, 15 of whom died on the spot after being shot. The others died from their wounds or illnesses because they could not get to the hospital. Among them was a 35-day-old baby and a 71-year-old man who had attempted to get bread during the curfew. The three rebellious neighborhoods of Nur, Sur, and Chudi were riddled with bullets and larger ammunition. The state blamed the PKK for these deaths although not one member of the state forces was injured, giving the lie to the pretense that the neighborhoods were filled with terrorists. This latest massacre in Chisere will be remembered for a long time and fuel the Kurdish movement. The Revolution in Kurdistan Like the movements that preceded it, Gezi took great inspiration from the uprisings in Egypt, Tunisia, and the Arab Spring that were able to topple dictators swiftly. Although Erdogan still sits on his throne in the palace he built for himself for over a billion dollars, Gezi was not a complete failure, as it opened a new space for joyful revolt in Turkey's future. Syria, another country that rose up during the Arab Spring, seems to have experienced a similarly bittersweet outcome. Bashar al-Assad crushed the rebellion in the central cities of Syria, while the periphery was thrown into a brutal civil war that opened up the stage for jihadist groups from Iraq and elsewhere to arrive and eventually converge under the banner of ISIS. The silver lining in Syria was supplied by the Kurds in Rojava, who had been organizing clandestinely for decades to support the PKK in the north and to establish their own political and military structures. As in Turkey, the Assad regime did not permit the expression of the Kurdish identity or education in the mother tongue, underscoring the similarity between Kemalism and Baathism. A massacre in the city of Kamishlo, in which the Syrian regime killed 52 people after a soccer riot on March 12, 2004, is often cited as the forebear of the Rojava revolution. The main Kurdish political party, the PYD, is for all intents and purposes the sister organization of the PKK. Ujalan's portrait is ubiquitous in Rojava. The PYD and others organized under the banner of Tevdem, the Movement for a Democratic Society, took advantage of the approaching instability in Syria to declare autonomy on July 19, 2012. It was a relatively smooth operation, as preparatory meetings had already taken place in mosques throughout the region, more of a takeover than a battle. They organized themselves into three cantons running along the Turkish border, separated from each other by primarily Arab regions. These cantons are Afrin in the west, Kobane in the center, and Chizre in the east. It was almost unbelievable that after decades of fighting, the Kurds, now in pursuit of democratic confederalism, had claimed their own territory. Ujalan's democratic autonomy and confederalism is the vision being implemented in Rojava. Autonomy, ecology, and women's liberation are the three central points of emphasis. The most basic unit of this new society is the commune. Communes exist from the neighborhood level to workplaces, including small petroleum refineries and agricultural cooperatives. There are communes specific to women, such as the women's houses. All of these communes are organized into assemblies that go up to the canton level. The current economic model in Rojava is mixed. There are private, state, and communal enterprises. In the Rojava social contract, 
something akin to their constitution, private property is not fully disqualified, but it is said that there will be limits imposed upon it. It's a society still in transition. So far, it is much more anti-state than anti-capitalist, but it's undeniable that there's a strong anti-capitalist push from within. Time will show how far the revolutionaries of Rojava are willing to take it. The revolution in Rojava is a women's revolution. The Kurdish movement for liberation places women's liberation above anything else. In addition to having their own army and autonomous women-only organizations, almost every organizational structure, from the municipal governments to the armed PKK formations, is run by co-chairmanship of a man and a woman. Quotas are imposed for memberships and other positions, so that equal participation from both genders is ensured. March 8th, International Women's Day, is taken very seriously by Kurdish women, and even more so now with the women's resistance exemplified by the YPJ, the Women's Division of the People's Defense Units, or YPG. In his writings, Ujalan recognizes patriarchy and the separation of genders as the first social problem in history. Perhaps paradoxically, many Kurdish women militants attribute their liberation to Ujalan in his thought. The fighters. Even though the Kurdish seizure of power in Rojava went smoothly, the honeymoon was brief. After capturing a large amount of military machinery from Mosul on June 10, 2014, ISIS pushed north in Iraq and in Syria. With its advance came stories of massacres, enslavement, displacement, and rape. A month and a half later, in August, ISIS reached the Yazidi population a non-Muslim Kurdish-speaking community near the Sinjar Mountains, where they killed thousands and displaced nearly 290,000 people, 50,000 of whom were stranded on mountains without food or water. ISIS fighters seemed especially keen on wiping out this population belonging to a pre-Islamic faith with many animistic aspects, who had been persecuted for centuries as devil worshippers, withstanding more than 70 massacres in their history. The Iraqi Kurdish regional government lacked the agility to intervene with its Peshmerga forces, in contrast to the PKK, who mobilized rapidly, traveling across the country from its main base on the Iraq-Iran border in Kandil. In coming to the rescue of the Yazidi people and arming and training this population for self-defense, the PKK gained credibility in the region run by Barzani and his KDP. Despite the tensions between regional Kurdish forces, all the stories and images ISIS circulated through social media had the effect of unifying the once disparate Kurds, as the PKK and YPG joined with the KDP in an uneasy alliance. Of all the Kurdish armed forces, the YPG is the newest. The People's Defense Forces were formed shortly after the revolution, and their numbers quickly swelled with volunteers joining to defend Kurdish territories from ISIS. This wartime mobilization is also supported by conscription, which has started to create tension among young people who are not interested in fighting, or who say they have already done their military service with the Assad regime. But beyond this simmering point, in places such as Kobani, the YPG and the YPJ are comprised of people defending their own towns and cities. Kobani became ground zero in the resistance as ISIS closed in, little by little, taking villages on the outskirts of the city thanks to their recently obtained military superiority. ISIS was especially keen to capture Kobani, as it occupies the most direct route between the Turkish border and the de facto ISIS capital of Raqqa. In addition, Kobani was also the launching point of the revolution in Rojava. The YPG and YPJ offered a heroic resistance with the little firepower they had, mostly small arms supported by rocket-propelled grenades and the higher-caliber Russian dushkas mounted on the backs of pickup trucks. As they retreated further and further into the city proper of Kobani, the YPG and J reached near celebrity status, thanks in part to the West's romanticization and objectification of YPJ women fighting the bearded hordes of ISIS. Everyone from prominent leftist academics to Marie Claire magazine, who featured the YPJ, <laughs> to the amusement of YPJ members in Kobani, started singing the praises of the Kurdish fighters. One has to admit the neatness of the contrast on the Rojava battlefield a feminist army courageously resisting misogynist bands of fundamentalists. Apparently, many fighters within ISIS believe that if a woman kills them, they will not enter heaven as glorious martyrs. 
This belief is known by members of the YPJ and used in a form of psychological warfare on the front lines. The women of the YPJ make it a point to sound their shrill battle cry, a well-known Kurdish exclamation of rage or suffering called zilgit, before they enter into battle with ISIS. They are making sure the jihadists know that they are about to be sent to hell. Hundreds of Kurds from Turkey crossed the border to join the YPG forces defending Kobane, alongside PKK guerrilla units that moved into the region. Turkish leftists also started making the journey, becoming martyrs themselves. In one case, Sufi Nejat Urnashli, a sociology student at one of the most prestigious universities in Istanbul, influenced in his own writings by the French journal Tikkun, went to Rojava, only to be martyred after a few weeks. The nom de guerre he had chosen was Paramaz Kizilbash, a synthesis of the name of a well-known Armenian socialist revolutionary executed by the Ottomans in the Alevi faith, historically repressed in Turkey. This exemplifies the character of solidarity in the region. A Turkish revolutionary, assuming the name of an Armenian one, going to defend the Kurdish revolution. As reported in the Western media, many Americans and Europeans also made the journey to join the ranks of the fighters in Rojava. Some integrated into the YPG or YPJ. Others joined other units, such as the United Freedom Forces, comprised of communists and anarchists. Apart from international revolutionaries arriving in solidarity with the Kurdish struggle for liberation, there are also ex-military or military wannabes from the UK or US who believe that the war against Islamic extremists that they were tricked out of by corrupt British and American governments has finally arrived. Some of these internationals have started to warm to the political philosophy of democratic autonomy as practiced by their comrades in arms. Others quickly got out, realizing they were among a bunch of reds. The international revolutionaries fighting alongside their Kurdish comrades will return to their homelands with strategic experience in the battlefield in a renewed sense of inspiration and perspective on what is possible when people commit themselves to liberation. In the middle of 2014, it appeared that Kobane was about to fall. Solidarity demonstrations were held globally. Riots shook Turkey to pressure Erdogan to stop supporting ISIS. In the meantime, meetings were held between the regional powers to figure out a response. YPG members in Kobane recount that it appeared to be a matter of hours before the city would fall. They had retreated to a central part of that city, gathering their ammunition to be destroyed rather than captured by ISIS. It was at that moment, rather than a month earlier when ISIS had not even entered the city, that the much-promised U.S. and French airstrikes finally began in earnest. Beyond a doubt, without that aerial support, the minimally armed YPG forces would not have emerged victorious. The fact that the bombardment came at the very last possible minute shows that, aside from whatever backroom negotiations and deals were taking place, NATO countries did not want an ISIS victory, but at the same time they apparently wanted the Kurds to inherit a completely destroyed city. NATO assistance in the Kurdish self-defense is a touchy subject, to say the least, especially considering that the capture of Ujlan was understood as a NATO operation. When this reality is brought up among YPG members in Kobane, they first joke about Comrade Obama. Pushed further, they point out that while the U.S. and Israel are bad, they aren't nearly as bad as the Arab regimes. But really, at the end of the day, it's simply a matter of survival. Ideally, the YPG would be able to obtain the necessary weaponry to mount their own defense. But lacking that, if the question is between ideological purity and survival, the choice seems clear. Kobani. Immediately after its liberation from ISIS, Kobani was a war-torn ruin in which most buildings had lost their upper floors to artillery fire. Aerial bombardment by coalition forces also did significant damage. Mahmud, a friend and comrade from Kobani, showed me around the city he had never left in his life, his eyes filled with tears as he remembered all his friends who died in those streets. We were walking in a ghost town, where the only people we saw were fighters or the small number of holdouts who had stayed behind, or just returned from refugee camps in Turkey. They could be seen digging through the rubble, trying to salvage anything from the wreckage. Unexploded munitions and booby traps left behind ISIS continued to kill even after their departure, 
with at least ten dead in the first two weeks following the city's liberation. Despite the high toll paid by the Kurds, the number of fighters killed was above two thousand. There was a sense of excitement and victory in the air, as news came in daily of ISIS units being pushed back further and further. Mahmoud is one of three brothers, all of whom are members of the YPG in one role or another. Like practically all of the YPG who have been through the conflict, they have shrapnel in their bodies and hearing loss from explosions and gunfire. An experienced machinist by training, he found a role in the ranks as a gunsmith, not only fixing weapons, but also manufacturing new designs, especially long-range sniper rifles. Yet he was only able to play this part until ISIS entered the city limits of Kobani. After that, everyone took up arms to fight, including his 13-year-old shop assistant. Stories of heroism are everywhere, from the sniper who blew up an ISIS tank by shooting his round into its muzzle, to others who gallantly climbed on top of another tank to throw a grenade down its hatch. Stories pile upon stories as Mahmoud takes me through the city streets, narrating the months-long battle of Kobani. During one stretch, he didn't sleep for five days straight, not only because they were under constant attack, but also because he was so afraid. He said that at one point he wanted to die just so that it would be over. From his platoon of about a hundred people, only four are still alive. We spend many hours looking at pictures of his fallen comrades on his phone. Many of the YPG have smartphones, including Mahmud and his brother Arif, who would be reprimanded by their commander for checking Facebook while they were engaged in trench warfare. His brother Arif was a sniper, but he left the YPG after the trauma of shooting a comrade by mistake. The stench of death was strong in some neighborhoods, with bodies still under the wreckage and the corpses of ISIS fighters rotting alongside roads littered with abandoned tanks destroyed by the YPG. To prevent the spread of disease, the bodies of ISIS fighters were usually burned, but the sheer number of corpses made it impossible to deal with them all. Even surrounded by all this death and carnage, joyful moments were common, perhaps due to news of advances arriving from the front. We spent our evenings hunting chickens with M16s for dinner, then smoking nargile after nargile, singing around a fire, waiting for the sun to rise over the Turkish border in the distance. National Liberation from Borders Surreal as it was for U.S. planes to assist radical leftist fighters, the aerial bombardment started to shift the tide towards the YPG as they took back territory from ISIS bit by bit, eventually pushing them to the western bank of the Euphrates and coming within 40 kilometers of Raqqa. On July 1, 2015, joint operations between the Free Syrian Army and the YPG liberated Tel Abiyad from ISIS. The significance of this was multifold. First, this was the most coordination to occur yet between the FSA and the YPG, perhaps appeasing some of the concerns of Syrian revolutionaries who regard the Kurds as pro-Assad. Second, an important ISIS border access point into Turkey was captured, closing a corridor they had been maintaining into Syria and Raqqa. But perhaps most significantly of all, the taking of Tel Abiyad the taking of Tel Abiyad connected the eastern canton of Chizira with Kobane, creating an uninterrupted stretch of Rojava and breaking the isolation of Kobane for the first time. The Kurds are one of the many casualties of borders crossing the peoples of the world, in their case, the borders drawn by Sykes-Picot at the end of the First World War. These borders between Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Iran are the ones the Kurds are attempting to remove and it is this experience that informs their critique of borders everywhere. The Kurds are often mentioned as a people without a nation-state. The PKK led a national liberation struggle for decades, and the Kurdish liberation struggle can still be classified as such, but not in the classical sense. It's almost like national liberation updated for the 21st century. Both in Turkey and in Syria, the Kurdish movement is trying to provide a common fighting platform for all oppressed peoples, leftist revolutionaries, and others, a collective of peoples they often refer to as the forces of democracy. This platform resembles the intercommunalism of Huey Newton in that it promotes solidarity and common action while preserving the autonomy of each constituent. 
This is evident in the politics of the HDP, and more significantly, in the self-governance structures in Rojava, especially in the eastern canton of Chizere, where Kurds, Arabs, and Assyrians live together, participate in communal self-governance, and mobilize fighting forces within the YPG. For a region plagued by ethnic division, the Kurdish proposition is a third way. This is how they refer to their project to contrast it with the choice between ISIS and the Assad regime on one side of the border, and between the AKP and Turkish nationalism on the other. This proposition presents democratic modernity as an alternative to capitalist modernity, and self-governance via confederalism as an alternative to the nation-state. The Kurds are not the only ones attempting to break the borders of the Middle East. In addition to ISIS, who has successfully redrawn the map, Erdogan also has his own ambitions under the rubric of the Great Middle East Project, in which Turkey would assume its rightful role, neo-Ottomanism, as the dominant regional power. Already today, most of the foreign business in Barzani's Kurdish region in northern Iraq is Turkish capital. A strong PYD and PKK in the region would be an obstacle to this project. Elections and a Massacre For 13 years, the AKP has won overwhelming victories in the Turkish national elections, holding power as a single party. The HDP was able to harness anti-Erdogan sentiment with a clever political strategy during the run-up to the historic elections of June 7, 2015. The Turkish electoral system has a 10% threshold. Unless a party receives 10% of the national vote or above, it cannot enter parliament, and the votes cast for it are effectively void. To sidestep this, the Kurdish movement has usually run independent candidates who, after winning a seat, would become party members. While this runaround strategy has helped to get about 35 representatives into parliament, receiving more than 10% of the vote would secure at least twice as many positions. The election of June 7th presented the possibility to displace the AKP and sabotage Erdogan's ambitions of increasing his own powers by means of constitutional changes that would make him the ultimate patriarch of Turkey. Silatin Demirtas, the youthful and charismatic co-chair of the HDP, made We Won't Let Him Become President one of his main campaign slogans. The hatred of Erdogan that had culminated in the Gezi uprising intersected with discontent over Erdogan's support of ISIS and enthusiasm inspired by the resistance of Kobani. Consequently, the HDP secured 13% of the national vote and 80 MPs, creating a situation in which no single party could form a government by itself and necessitating that a coalition form to assume power. The relationship between the armed PKK and the electoral HDP is delicate yet complementary. The HDP must strike a difficult balance. They receive their legitimacy in the eyes of the Kurdish population as the above-ground wing of the armed struggle. But they also need to distance themselves occasionally in order to play the political game successfully on the national scale. Erdogan and his cronies, who are shrewd and aware of this, stoke the fires wherever they can by pitting the HDP against the PKK, and both of them against Ujlan, whom they portray as more level-headed. An easy task when communication with him is controlled by the state and no one has heard from him in five months. The HDP is in a precarious position as a legal and unarmed political party often subject to the same repression as PKK members. Following the election, no one could work out how to create a coalition government. As everyone's attention was focused on the electoral stalemate, Erdogan made it clear that he would push for early elections to give the population another opportunity to bring the AKP to power. Then came the massacre in Suruj. It was just another delegation of young leftists from Istanbul to Kurdistan, this one was organized by the Socialist Youth Association's Federation, with the goal of giving a hand in the rebuilding of Kobani, bringing toys to refugee children and planting trees in the region. On the morning of July 20, 2015, SGDF organized a press conference at the Amara Cultural Center, the de facto convergence center, for volunteers traveling to assist with the refugee camps. In the midst of this, a suicide bomber killed 34 people. This massacre shocked the whole country, setting in motion a downward spiral of events. 
Two days later, Erdogan cut a deal with the U.S. to allow them the use of a Turkish airbase against ISIS in exchange for their tacit support of a new campaign of annihilation against the PKK. Seizing upon the murder of two police officers the day after the bombing for justification, a retaliation later explicitly disowned by the official channels of the PKK, the Turkish government began a massive air campaign against PKK positions in northern Iraq and southeastern Turkey. In addition, raids took place across the country, resulting in more than 2,000 arrests and continuing to this day. So belligerent were the actions of the AKP that they even arrested one of the injured from the socialist delegation bombed in Suruj. The AKP claimed that it was going after all the extremist terrorists in the country, the PKK, ISIS, and the Marxist-Leninist group, the DHKPC, the Revolutionary People's Liberation Party Front. Of these three, the DHKPC does not hold a candle to the others in terms of numbers or effectiveness. It seems they were just thrown in for good measure. While the AKP and Erdogan claim in the media that they are also going after ISIS, in reality this is nothing but window dressing. Of the 2,544 arrested by the end of August, less than 5% were arrested on allegations of belonging to ISIS, and many of those were later released. Of the bombing campaign totaling approximately 400 airstrikes, only three targeted ISIS. These airstrikes are targeting PKK camps, especially the central one of Kandil. But civilians have also been killed, including 10 in the nearby Iraqi village of Zelgir. Although the Suraj bombing targeted the Kurdish movement, it is being used as an excuse to decimate it. As of this writing, at the beginning of September 2015, According to the Turkish Human Rights Association, more than 47 civilians and 47 PKK guerrillas have been killed. The PKK is hitting back hard wherever it can. As of now, at least 92 policemen or soldiers have been killed, and 24 officials of the state or security forces kidnapped. In response to this repression, Kurdish towns and cities rose up with demonstrations and riots in every single town for many nights in a row. The response by the state was brutal. Media pundits observed that the country had regressed to the bloody 1990s. While this was certainly the case from the standpoint of the state, the Kurdish movement has evolved. Kurds in more than 16 towns took the initiative to declare autonomy from the state and began to emphasize their right to self-defense. These declarations were met with more brutality and arrests. Especially in the towns of Silopi and Chizure, the state responded by using snipers to go after children and citizens who weren't even directly involved in the conflicts. House raids and extrajudicial executions soon followed. Bombings of the countryside have resulted in catastrophic forest fires, inflicting yet another form of anguish on the region. Many towns in the region are still declared special security zones, a designation akin to martial law. Curfews and operations by special forces are widespread. The successes of the Kurds on both sides of the Turkish-Syrian border their smart political choices and heroic fighting maneuvers have pushed the AKP and Erdogan to a breaking point. If the current drive for a truly fascist police state is any indication, his fall from power will be as brutal as his reign. I am inspired by the perseverance of the Kurds who are attempting to break out of stale leftist dogmas while still insisting on revolution. The transformation of a social movement of millions does not occur overnight but they have begun to implement new social relations and structures that aim at abolishing the state and other hierarchies, such as that of men over women or humans over non-humans. From my observations, I believe that this stubborn multi-generational struggle has the potential to transform the world's most sectarian region into autonomous zones of cooperation and solidarity. As long as they are able to survive ISIS and the Turkish state and continue constructing their revolution from below, they will have much more to teach all of us fighting for liberation elsewhere. In the four years since Crime Think published this text, quite a lot has developed. The attempted coup led by some Turkish military leaders in 2016 led to a major crackdown on all dissent and social movements in Turkey as Erdogan consolidated his power. 
repression against the Kurdish movement, as well as anarchists and other radicals, has intensified. Even as the SDF systematically eliminated the remaining strongholds of ISIS from Syria, the Turkish military was preparing for an invasion that would dislodge Kurdish forces from their territories near the Turkish border. In early 2018, Turkish and allied Turkish Free Syrian Army forces began the bombardment and attack on the city of Afrin, displacing hundreds of thousands of refugees. After taking the city in March, they began resettling Arabs into abandoned areas of the predominantly Kurdish city and region. The invasion that is going on now is a continuum of this process of ethnic cleansing, enabled by a broad crackdown against Kurdish and other rebellious forces in and around Turkey. To learn more about how things have developed in Kurdistan and in Turkey since then, we contacted one of the authors of Understanding the Kurdish Resistance. In the following interview, we discuss what has changed, Turkish strategy and resistance to it, and prospects for solidarity. It's been four years since Crime Think published Understanding the Kurdish Resistance. In that time, a lot has changed. What do you think are the most important shifts that have taken place since then? How did the failed coup attempt shift the calculus of power in Turkey? How did the crackdown in its aftermath impact the Kurdish movement? The 2016 coup attempt provided the perfect pretext for Erdogan to cement his power. He was able to successfully purge his old Gulenist allies, who had become a threat to his reign, as well as unleash an unparalleled level of repression against all opposition, including the Kurdish movement and various leftist groups and activists. The declaration of a state of emergency gave Erdogan extraordinary powers to issue emergency decrees, which led to the jailing of more than 8,000 members of the Kurdish-led People's Democratic Party, HDP, the dismissal of more than 6,000 academics from their universities for opposition views, and an almost zero-tolerance policy for any public demonstration critical of the AKP. The coup attempt also provided a renewed origin story, injecting lifeblood into an AKP which had been finding itself on the ropes since the Gezi uprising of 2013, which Erdogan has attempted incredibly to link to the coup attempt. The public displays glorifying citizen martyrs who died opposing the military, and the renaming of bridges, parks, avenues, and many other public spaces to reflect the events of July 15, 2016, keeps this event alive in the psyche of Turks and creates a sense of national unity in the face of foreign enemies. Of relevance to the Kurdish struggle is the restructuring of the military following the coup attempt. In fact, many of the high-ranking commanders involved in the coup were also behind the brutal military invasions and curfews during the summer and fall of 2015 against Kurdish towns within Turkey, where more than 4,000 people were slaughtered. The implication of these officials in the coup allowed Erdogan to wash his hands of responsibility to a degree, but also provided for some embarrassing moments where Gulenist prosecutors and judges who were leading the charges against Kurdish and leftist activists suddenly found themselves on the other side of the equation. The whole judicial and law enforcement system which had been populated by Gulenist cadres has been thrown into somewhat of a disarray. The military leadership once occupied by Gulenists have now been taken over by the more old-school Turkish nationalist cadres, and it goes without saying that these characters are just as hostile, if not more so, to the Kurdish movement as their predecessors were. It's highly plausible that they've also been a big factor in encouraging the current attack against Rojava. What is Erdogan's and the AKP's longer-term plan for dealing with Kurdish resistance in the territories of Rojava? Erdogan's grip on power has been slipping recently. Most notably, the victory of the center-left nationalist Republican People's Party, the CHP, in the Istanbul mayoral election, despite an imposed re-election by the AKP, has been a serious blow. Additionally, some of the longtime AKP members, including some of its founders, have split from Erdogan and are considering forming a new party. The same goes for the ultranationalist MHP, or Nationalist Movement Party, who have been in a tenuous alliance with the weakened AKP. The invasion of Rojava and the ensuing wartime mobilization 
has effectively silenced any semblance of mainstream political opposition. The recent parliamentary vote to greenlight the invasion was approved by all political parties, except for the Kurdish-led HDP. Lone politicians from the CHP or other political figures who voice their opposition to Erdogan's colonial ambitions are subject to a barrage of attacks in the media and by the judicial apparatus. The dream of annexing Rojava to Turkey also provides other advantages to Erdogan. For a considerable length of time, the Turkish economy and currency has been on the brink of collapse. The war economy naturally helps, but even more promising are the aspirations for construction and redevelopment projects in Rojava. Additionally, Turkey is home to more than 3 million Syrian refugees and unknown thousands of jihadists sheltered and trained by the Turkish state. All of the mainstream political parties have been spouting racist rhetoric against Syrian refugees to increase their votes. For the AKP, this has also involved scapegoating them for the declining economy. According to the latest numbers, unemployment is around 14% across the country. Annexing and repopulating Rojava with Syrian refugees not only decimates the Kurdish population there, but also feeds into the racism against Syrians mounting in the western cities of Turkey, such as Istanbul. Erdogan also likens himself to a neo-Ottoman leader with imperial aspirations for the region. This calls for a certain degree of muscle flexing, even if there is no long-term strategy at play. But perhaps at the bottom of it all is the ingrained enmity between the Turkish state, at its foundation regardless of the ruling party, and the Kurdish people fighting for autonomy and recognition. Having recently neutralized the PKK to a great degree within the borders of the country, now the time has come to take the war to them where they are the strongest, in Rojava. What's the state of both the Kurdish and the anarchist and radical movements inside Turkey today? How are they responding to the invasion? With the extraordinary powers concentrated in the Erdogan presidency in the post-coup political landscape, repression reigns supreme in Turkey. Even just mentioning that you are against the war and for peace is sufficient to get you arrested. Freedom of speech and expression is non-existent, and the internet is censored to a great degree. Journalists with opposition viewpoints collect court cases by the dozens, and are sometimes imprisoned even without charges. Anarchists and radicals had been able to carve out some more space and even organize successful marches, such as against gold mining projects. And the women's movement has been steadfast in organizing its mass annual March 8th demonstrations. But such perceived tolerance from the state goes out the window when it comes to expressing solidarity with the Kurds. Unfortunately, for now all that can be done, and still with great risk, is to express opposition and disagreement with the invasion of Rojava. Direct actions and demonstrations are not present except for at a very small level in Kurdistan, which are instantaneously and brutally repressed by the Turkish state. How can we fight against the invasion and in solidarity with Rojava in a way that supports the radical currents inside Turkish society? Of course, there are a considerable number of Turks who are against the invasion of Rojava and in solidarity with the Kurdish struggle, as well as active in other radical and revolutionary projects. Some of them have even joined the SDF with their own fighting units. But for now, they are unable to act effectively within the borders of Turkey due to the overwhelming repression. This creates the unfortunate impression that all of Turkey is pro-war and against Kurdish autonomy. The HDP was conceived partly as a project to amplify the Kurdish movement by forging a common struggle with the radical Turkish left, concentrated in western Turkey. It has been relatively successful, but the current predicament also shows that the Kurdish people cannot rely on much except their own organization and power in fighting for their liberation. Actions that target the Turkish state, such as at their embassies and state-owned businesses such as Turkish Airlines, will keep up the pressure, in solidarity not only with the Kurds, but also with other radical currents inside Turkey. Many Turkish and Kurdish radicals are exiled from Turkey and are politically active in other countries, and often work together. Anarchists and other radicals can support these organizing efforts, as well as spending time and becoming more familiar with the ideas and developments from the region. Learning from the Kurdish proposals of democratic confederalism, autonomy, and genealogy, women's science, and implementing the applicable lessons to your locality is an effective form of solidarity, which goes beyond the current, although very necessary, emergency response to the Turkish invasion.
We'll continue our exploration of the crisis in Rojava later this week when we release another episode with interviews from folks who've participated in solidarity work there recently. In the meantime, you can check out our website, crimethink.com slash podcast, for the full transcript of this episode and plenty of links, including our past episodes on the struggle in Rojava, lists of upcoming solidarity actions and targets for demonstrations and boycotts, and more. You can reach us by email at podcast at crimethink.com with any feedback or suggestions. And please, please, wherever you are, take some kind of action, whatever you can do to fight back against the Turkish invasion and against the growing threat of fascism, nationalism, and militarism across the world. Know that you are not alone and that there are many thousands of us in struggle alongside you. Till next time, keep loving and keep fighting.